All righty. Um, I have 105 on my computer clock, so um, I want to welcome everybody here. My name is Mary Warner. I'm executive director of the Morrison County Historical Society. This is brick three of brick by brick building community development through history. And um, if you see the little image, the brick by brick on your screen with the brick wall uh, kind of behind the words, that's the brick wall that's right behind me. I took a picture of that. Um, and interestingly enough, this brick is salvaged brick from St. Adelbert's Church, and it is serving as the um, the fireplace here at the Warehouser Museum in Little Falls. So we've got a little history built into uh, some of our visual materials as well. Um, so uh, I want to just welcome everybody here. And uh, this particular um, brick is going to be a panel discussion uh, among four of us. And we're going to be talking about history as infrastructure and the role of history in community development. And I want to tell you kind of where I got the idea for um, history as infrastructure. Uh, last summer, we've been dealing actually here at the Warehouser Museum. We're on the Mississippi River at the confluence of Pike Creek. And we've been dealing with a lot of severe erosion along our Mississippi River Bank. And our museum sits about 20 feet from the upper edge of that bank. So when we start seeing, um, you know, ground just shearing off as happened last June during a massive rainstorm, we get very worried that our building is going to end up in the river floating downstream to St. Cloud. Um, and so in trying to find some assistance uh, to mitigate that erosion, I, you know, we called various agencies and, and tried to get some help. And one of the people I called was Tim Terrell, who was the executive executive director of the Mississippi Headwaters Board. And he explained to me, he said, you know, if if your building was like a bridge, like that Pike Creek Bridge just down below you, well, that's infrastructure and the state would jump in and help. And I thought, wait a second, our museum is every bit as much of infrastructure as the bridge is, including all of the stuff that we have inside our museum. And so at that point, I was like, that's it. I'm going to start talking about history as being infrastructure because it very much is part of our infrastructure for every community. And um, and that infrastructure is not only what we see and are you know very much aware of in terms of our more current history, it goes all the way back to the people from before our time, the native people who had this land. Um, in fact, we're at the point where we've um, written a grant for a phase one archeology span survey of our Warehouser Museum property, because this confluence, um, a confluence for the native people is incredibly important uh, as a site for them. And uh, so we want to have this archeological survey done and actually involved um, at least the Ojibwe tribe in trying to get that done. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that this is the base of our history is that native people, Ojibwe and Dakota in central Minnesota, Dakota within um, southern Minnesota, were here before and are still here. Uh, Minnesota is still uh, home to 11 federally recognized tribes and uh, their historical land use continues to impact the land use today. Um, so, and we just build upon that. Um, so now I want to turn this over to Amy Pekarski. Uh, she is our moderator from Sourcewell, and she's going to do some introductions, and then we're going to get started on our panel discussion. Thanks, Mary. Uh, today we have a very dedicated group of professionals and leaders who have made an impact in their community. Their experience will provide some insight and opportunity for you to take back to your own communities. Before we get Introducing our speakers, though, I wanted to share just a few housing items. This is part three, like Mary said, of the three part series. This session will be recorded, and the other two were recorded. Everyone was muted, so that we ask, we ask that you use the chat feature to ask any questions of the panel. Uh, it's located in the lower right hand corner. If well, welcome to questions at the end of each presentation, otherwise, the majority of the time at the end is for the questions and answers with our panelists. Our first panelist is Mary Warner, who did our lovely introduction. Mary has been with the Morrison County Historical Society for over 24 years, 
serving as the organization's executive director. Her favorite part of the job is uncovering and writing up little known history. She currently serves as a board member on both the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits and the State Review Board, which reviews nominations to the National Register of Historic Places. Our next panelist is Todd Holman. Todd is the Mississippi Headwaters Program Director for the MN North Dakota South Dakota Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. He has worked for the Conservancy since 2004. Todd coordinates the Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape Program, facilitates the North Central Conservation Roundtable Consortium, and has developed protection program implementation in the Pine River, Crow Wing River, and Upper Mississippi Watersheds. Over several years in the land use planning for Todd County, Crow Wing County, and Community Director for the City of Baxter. He served the City of Baxter for 13 years as Vice Mayor of the City Council. Then is Melissa Wendt. Melissa has worked for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for nearly two decades and currently works for the agency within the Sustainable Materials Management Program. She is the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's Built Environment Sustainability Administrator, and her current focus is on creating system-wide change within the building material management. With key stakeholders across the state, Melissa is working to prevent C&D materials going to landfill encouraging preservation, reuse, repair, and recycling of building materials. Previously, she was the state's industrial stormwater program coordinator. Over the years, she coordinated project-specific sustainability efforts and volunteer within her community. She's a year-round cyclist, a community leader through her work on past and present city and county boards. She designs and installs native gardens and mentors community members on how to be an accessibility advocate. She lives by her work motto, human being first, government employee second. Our final panelist is King Banyan. King is a professor in the Department of Economics and Dean of the School of Public Affairs at St. Cloud State University. He holds the PhD in economics from the Claremont Graduate School. He has consulted at central banks and ministries of finance in several developing countries. He is the author of books and over 50 articles discussing monetary policy and political economy, as well as an occasional paper on the economics of sports. A former state representative from St. Cloud, he is co-author of the St. Cloud Quarterly Business Report and hosts a radio program in Minneapolis. I will now turn things over to Mary to get us started. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> so my first slide, Amy, if you can put that up. It is very text heavy, so I'm going to do some reading. It actually could be a much longer list. Um, uh, we will be having these materials uh, on our website at the Morrison County uh, Historical <laughs> Society afterwards. So um, if you can't read this, uh, you know, you, you will have a chance to see it later. Um, so what I wanted to start with is just to list some of the ways that our Morrison County Historical Society um, very specifically helps with community development. Uh, so um, there's my list of 14 things. Uh, we help communities identify important historic and cultural assets. We identify historic resources, resources prior to major construction projects, which has to do with Section 106 letters. We assist municipalities with research needed for preservation projects, which includes historic districts and redevelopment projects. We help communities with signage and marketing materials based on heritage tourism. Uh, we also help owners research their building history, houses or businesses. Uh, we provide resources and advice for National Register nominations, internships for college students. We help authors and creators with research for publications and projects. We write history and provide programs that inspire people to connect to the music, to the community. We partner with other history and culture organizations to create a stronger sector. We provide research expertise for resources outside of our institutions. We provide education and preservation techniques. We generate direct economic impact through heritage tourism. And we synthesize the past to point the way toward future opportunities. Um, our history museums, along with their staff, um, they have so much expertise 
expertise that is important in terms of the infrastructure of the entire community uh, and need to be supported uh, commensurate with that. Amy, would you turn to the next slide? One of the things I wanted to do was give, actually give you some pictures. So within our building, we have a number of resources. Um, I'm going to show you a few here. Um, you'll see on the left a whole bunch of boxes that include our photos from our photo collection. And then just one of the photo postcards of the Buckman building uh, is on the right. That particular photo, these photos of the Buckman building that we had in our files helped when they were restoring the Buckman building in downtown Little Falls. They directly used our photos so they knew what the building looked like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you'll see um, a couple different pictures on the left show our bound newspaper collections from uh, count the county. So we have the Little Falls Daily Transcript and the Morrison County Record, along with a number of other newspaper collections from the county in our files. Uh, I use these newspapers all the time for my research, um, as do other folks who are coming in to um, look for county history. Uh, we also have plat books and then uh, boxes and boxes of compiled research, which is research that we as staff have put together ourselves based on specific topics. Uh, next slide, please. So all of those resources I'm showing you and more than, than you saw in those few pictures are used outside the museum for different projects. So here you see a photo of the um, Morrison County Courthouse, the historic one built in the 1890s. And the um, Morrison County Historical Society was actually involved in the effort to save this building and get it on the National Register of Historic Places. Our former executive director actually wrote the nomination for it to be on the National Register. So that's why this building is still standing directly because of help from the Morrison County Historical Society. Uh, on the right is a copy of the City of Little Falls downtown design guidelines that help with the historic district. And uh, I actually helped, I mean, this has been a long time I've been involved, but years ago when this was put together, I was helping the guy who um, who created this, Tom Zahn, uh, by pulling out research res uh, resources from our collection for this. Next slide. Uh, here we have um, a, on the left is a picture of the history of bolus that was done by Louis Tittle that was um, um, researched here at the Morrison County Historical Society, actually in the very room I'm sitting in. Uh, the second book is the Little Falls Historic Context Survey that was done by Gemini Research for the city of Little Falls, also researched here. Uh, and then we have a picture of the bust of Nathan Richardson, which is outside the Morrison County Courthouse. Uh, I worked on a history of Nathan Richardson, who's considered the father of Morrison County. Uh, and uh, that bust was created using a photo from our collection. And next slide. So we don't just use our photos and our paper collections. We also use our three dimensional collections to um, help people with further history. And this is a picture of an Ojibwe bandolier bag. Uh, it was presented to Nathan Richardson, Richardson by Chief Shabashkong uh, for Nathan's help in dealing with basically timber pirates at the Malak Band uh, of Ojibwe Reservation. Um, and Marsha Anderson, uh, who worked with the Minnesota Historical Society in collections, she created a book called A Bag Worth a Pony, which is about bandolier bags from around Minnesota. And uh, she featured this particular bag uh, actually on the cover page inside uh, because we actually had provenance on it. We knew where the bag came from and it, it's very difficult to pin down the provenance of some of these bags um, from very early on. So our three dimensional collections um, are just as, um, as, as important to helping people uh, with history as infrastructure um, for their different projects outside the museum. Okay, so I'm finished with this point, uh, Amy, if you.
gonna let Todd go. There, I think I'm good. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Um, again, Todd Holman, I'm uh, representing the Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape Partnership today as the coordinator. Um, but uh, as, as was shared in my intro, a lot of uh, variety of hats that I've worn over the years in this uh, central Minnesota region. Thrilled to be here and thank the Minnesota Historical or the Morrison County Historical Society for uh, creating this forum and, and pulling us together for this, this conversation in part three of this really great conversation. So thank you for the uh, privilege to be here today. Um, I wanted to just take a few minutes and talk about uh, the Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape uh, program that I oversee, but also uh, specifically Camp Ripley itself. Camp Ripley is a 53,000 acre state owned um, National Guard military training facility in, in central Minnesota. And this map just kind of gives some geographic context. And you can see Camp Ripley is in Morrison County, uh, the, the post itself, the, the training facility itself. But the program, the Sentinel Landscape Program that I'll talk about just briefly, actually extends out about a 10 mile radius and, and touches into four counties. So it's got a pretty large programmatic footprint um, compared to its actual land footprint, which exists in Morrison County. Of interest, um, Fort Ripley, which was its original um, creation uh, by the U.S. military in 1848 um, was established on this and is on the National Register of Historic Places. And the land configuration around that historic fort uh, is a little different than what it looks like today. But my point is there's been a military presence um, and activity in this geography for quite a long time, even before Minnesota was a state. Uh, fort Ripley was established during the uh, uh, when this area might have been called the frontier um, uh, as European settlement started to move north and west. Um, the Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape Program was developed by the Department of Defense um, in response to uh, two threats to military training and training sustainability. And those two threats were residential encroachment, uh, houses building too close to camp because again, Military installations are typically sited in relatively undeveloped rural areas, but over time, um, residential encroachment starts to get to get too close and, and too dense, and all of a sudden training is uh, having to be curtailed or changed. Uh, too much noise, can't run uh, 24 hours a day, things like that, and it affects the sustainability and the functionality of the training mission of, of the installation. Um, and in the natural resource element as well. So if the natural resources around the installation are converted or changed from their natural state um, to urban or to other forms that aren't compatible with the training mission, where do the, the threatened and endangered species go? And, and oftentimes the installation is the, the last harbinger of of the natural resource and so that too can affect training. So those are the two things that I work to help coordinate compatible land use. And so you saw in the title, um, how does the military installation kind of work into the matrix of the history of the county as well as um, working on land use connectivity. And so we work to support community goals. So township, county, city goals in this geography to promote things that they do that are compatible with the training mission. So keeping farms farms and keeping forests forests is, is kind of the mantra we use. And we support programs that help those things, keeping farms farms and forest forests sustainable over the long term. Um, so we Camp Ripley and and the work done there has really been part of the community infrastructure for quite a long time. Um, it creates jobs and it's been there so long that generations, matter of fact, there are some families that have had generations work uh, in and around the Camp Ripley, either on post uh, as, as potentially a training soldier or as a contractor or civilian staff member uh, on the installation. So long and deep history uh, with a lot of local residents. Um, and it also provides an economic uh, hub. It, Camp Ripley generates about 300 to $400 million annually in local economic impact. And so kind of in addition to the training mission, the community footprint that it provides, the jobs, it's also kind of a, a part of the, the financial infrastructure of the community as well. And so the, the, if it makes sense, uh, I think of Camp Ripley as a regional community center 
you know, providing a lot of services and a lot of integration. And in this case, within the Sentinel Landscape Program, which is a federal program between the U.S. Department of Ag, the Department of Defense, and the U.S. Department of Interior, these programs really are here to help lift up, build up what the community wants to do, keep working lands working, and, and try to action things that are uh, compatible with the long-term training mission, military mission of Camp Ripley. Um, the last piece I would share is that uh, we, the Camp Ripley Sentinel Landscape Program has been uh, in existence only since 2016, but it's kind of the last iteration uh, of where Camp Ripley and the National Guard is reaching out to try to be a partner in community and be a part of the community in any way that uh, is mutually beneficial. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Wenzel, as I was introduced, and I'm here to talk about what the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is doing for focusing on sustainable building material management. We do have a waste hierarchy in Minnesota where we're supposed to consider preservation and building reuse as one of our top priorities, and that's not quite what's happening. And so there's a lot of challenges to that. And I also want to say that while we're looking into the historic development of buildings themselves. I'm actually starting to, uh, and this is an initiative that I'm taking, looking into the people who make the buildings that we love so much. So, for example, I've been just starting to dig into the uh, state capital, Minnesota State Capitol, and find out the people who made the buildings. Uh, there's an African-American bricklayer by the name of Cassaville Bullard, who's featured, for example. So I'm honoring uh, the racial justice that I'm trying to do personally and professionally by looking into who makes the buildings. And that is part of the value system that I think we need to focus on. Next slide, please. So we in the United States generate more than twice the amount of municipal solid waste as C and D debris. So EPA estimates that we generate 600 million tons of C and D debris, where very little of it is reused or recycled. And right now we're thinking that of all the buildings that'll be demolished by 2050, a third of them exist right now. And a third of the buildings that exist will be demolished. And so that's a, a huge impact. And it has a ripple effect amongst our community at our landfills and so on. Next slide, please. So we actually, as a practice, as humans, uh, deconstructed on a regular basis. Materials were valuable and were built to last. And until we became a little bit more disposable back in World War II, right after World War II, we deconstructed and reused on a regular basis and also built to last. But you know, that mentality is coming back that uh, good quality materials shouldn't go to the landfill. The good quality materials should be attempted to be used, whether it's in the, the same structure or in another structure. That mentality is growing and growing around the nation and of course around the world. We see evidence of that in other countries more than Minnesota. But we're seeing that movement happen here too. Next slide. So recently we're getting contacted by city mayors and city staff across the Minnesota. They have buildings that, you know, maybe they're not functional as they were designed like these green elevators, but it doesn't mean that they should be burned down, which of course is now not what DNR wants to see happen to these structures burned for firefighter training. Um, I've been recently told that there are some valuable materials in wood grain elevators and the difficulty of getting a building down of this structure, this size is a challenge. However, if it's worth it to people to get the materials out of there, that will drive some of the potential building material reuse or deconstruction opportunities. Next slide. So we, when we talk in terms of value, we know that good quality durable materials are of value. 
I happened to be able to drive up to Duluth and see one of the buildings, uh, one of the houses being deconstructed. There are three houses that were vacant that uh, the city or the county, I forget which, uh, took ownership of and purposely worked with Better Futures Minnesota to have these houses uh, deconstructed as much as possible. So these buildings and these houses were built in the 19 teens and had old growth wood that of course was of value. There were local sales within the community, so these this wood actually got sold and made into new projects around the Duluth area. And so that does show the sort of value system that, you know, while an ugly house on the outside has some good bones on the inside and can be reused. Next slide. Closer to my home in St. Louis Park is a nature center that was deconstructed by the same group of people that were pictured in the last slide, Better Futures of Minnesota. So we, we know that the obvious large wood timbers uh, and other materials that you might see in these photos are a bit more obvious for reuse, but having a deconstructed deconstruction team to actually take apart the materials and that sometimes helps show the value of these materials in their raw form. And so sometimes it takes a, a trained eye to be able to see that these materials can be reused and built into another project like these large timbers. Next slide, please. We are recently partnering up with Rethos Places Reimagined, who is actually providing uh, training and education to realtors, to do-it-yourselfers, on how to repair things, how to repair parts of homes and windows and stuff like that. And it's really, to, to be able to see the training sessions going on for realtors who can actually do a great job explaining to home buyers why a house that may look a little bit in disrepair is actually the right house for them, for their affordability, uh, for their longevity. And uh, again, as I said earlier, a lot of structures were built to last, you know, 100, 100 plus years ago, and those homes can be, you know, reimagined to continue that lifespan. And so it's just so great to see all these other organizations who place value in some of these historical buildings. And they don't even have a necessarily a historical uh, stamp on it, by you know the Minnesota Historical Society, but at the same token, they still have worth, they still have life in them. And therefore enough of us are saying, let's preserve as much as possible. Let's preserve this, this history. Next slide. So unfortunately we are stuck in the waste hierarchy that's on the left of the screen, the traditional waste hierarchy. We actually have it in Minnesota statute, the so-called new waste management paradigm on the right. And that is basically my job is to move the, flip the pyramid basically, and making sure that prevention of waste is our number one goal. And that takes a lot of effort in a still kind of a disposable society. Uh, the people on this call and in this meeting might certainly appreciate what we're focusing on, the new waste management paradigm but to change an entire system that's been in place even before World War II has been a challenge. But uh, we've got a work group of people that we're working with and dedicated to these efforts. Next slide. So we had a work group, including people who are on this call, Anne Marie and, and Mary Warner, who helped us focus on how could we change the building material management system. And after a year of meeting with people uh, in person and then virtual, uh, we had a work group that came up with these five top system change recommendations. Um, having a deconstruction training program, creating incentives for preservation reuse of energy efficient buildings, creating a deconstruction ordinance template, um, having a diversion requirement, and creating incentives that encourage reused or reusable building materials. Um, it's a start. Uh, it's we we basically ended the work group with these top five ideas, and that was last September, September 2020. So we have a lot of work to do to make these uh, recommendations come to reality. Next slide. So I could speak for about two hours on this topic, and I probably went a minute or two over one <laughs> the five minute time that I have today. 
there's a lot that we're trying to do. And really right now we are working with so many partners across uh, Minnesota, like Anne Marie and, and Mary Warner and uh, cities, counties, nonprofits. They're the ones that are actually making the change right now. And uh, we're, we're here to help support those changes while we try to move the needle at a statewide level. So if you want to partner with us and work with us on uh, preserving and restoring buildings or reusing the materials, I welcome you to contact me. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Melissa. Let me, uh, I'm going to try to be a little bit brief. It's kind of odd when you hear the introductions of the various uh, speakers here today. I'm kind of a fish out of water uh, because I'm a monetary economist and people say, well, what the heck? Uh, what's that about? What's that all about? And what I tell them is um, I've been doing uh, research. When I did research in sports, I went to the National Baseball Library, which is next to the Hall of Fame. Uh, to research the price of tickets. I actually looked at individual tickets and it was there where I first started to realize the best way to learn something is actually get deep into the history of it. Uh, and uh, that that really had interested, interested me. So about uh, 17 years ago, um, I took uh, over a role that a, one of my colleagues had had in co-authoring the quarterly business report, as Amy mentioned, and um, started to do research on the local economy and thought, what, a, what an odd thing for me to do. This is, really not, this is really not my thing. I've become so attracted to this place that um, when I stopped being the Dean of the School of Public Affairs here at, at SESU, uh, my next stop is to start writing a book on the history of this region, economic history of this region. There has not been one written since the 1970s it's a good book, by the way. I don't wish to. I don't wish to say it left anything out. But there's like there's 50 years of history that hasn't been written yet, and that seems to be pretty important. But this this slide that's in front of you right now is in some ways a, a, a basically kind of an outline of maybe what a chapter of that book might look like. Uh, and 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 the view of it is this way. And I noticed that I have both my my one of my colleague, uh, I think maybe two of my colleagues here at uh, Saint Cloud State. One of them in my school, uh, the director of our planning community development program, uh, uh, Professor Ugachukwu. I saw in the, in the in, among the participants today. And welcome, Chukes. Uh, appreciate having you here. He also teaches heritage preservation, um, so he's a perfect person to, to be in this conversation with us here. Because what I what I've heard, and particularly in what I've heard in the presentations that Melissa and Mary and Todd have already given us, is there are layers of our history that we use and reuse in building the economy we have today. And if you look at the history of this through that lens, there's a certain certain way in which I think you can organize understanding this economy that is very different than I think the way in which, um, I think the way in which uh, an economist write, might write about it. And I actually would say maybe a little different than how a historian might write about it, which is how those books on the history of St. Cloud have been done. They've been done by historians and historians have a, have, have a methodology of telling a story that is different than maybe, than maybe an economist does. And I, I, but I need to borrow a lot of that to work. So, the basic, that first line is the way I think about it. Each layer of a city builds upon what's there already, okay? So if you think about the history of this area, okay, the Oxcart Trail actually predates the formation of Fort Ripley that Todd talked about, you know, being put there in 1848. Indeed, the fort is partly there because of the trail and, and, the, and the trade that's going on that's coming down from Canada into, into this area to be sent down the Mississippi River for people that wanted to buy fur. Uh, and, um, and so that was part of, part of what it was there for. Um, the city of St. Cloud really starts to get formed, but Sauk Rapids gets formed as well and, at, at that time. So the river passage becomes avail available. And, and, and Melissa, I, you got me to think about this particular fact. Um, I was reading the history of one of the steamers that came here in the 1850s that eventually ended up on another river. They had to deconstruct it from, from the Mississippi and move it 
piece by piece over to the sock. Or, no, I take that to the Minnesota River to get it onto that river to be used instead. So think about that for deconstruction. But as the value of what you can move with a steamer changes, you needed to move the ships onto different places. So you moved it to the Minnesota to the Minnesota to the Sock Rivers, depending on what, what it was you could you could do with it. So there's that trade. So eventually that trade becomes valuable enough that it starts looking for what other things could be traded. Right? St. Cloud, which is the piece that I'm trying to research, starts off basically as a trading place. There's a lot of there's a lot of people here who are trying to help send goods to people who are settling in the Dakotas, as well as continuing to facilitate that trade for the north. Um, but eventually we discover that, hey, there's this stuff here, these rocks in the ground that people really value. Uh, and that's granite. And we start sending it to to down to the to the um to to we start sending it down uh, the river to Minneapolis and St. Paul to be used in bridge construction and building construction. Some of it gets used here in the local community. Eventually, we look at the granite and decide that's really going to be sort of our motto. Indeed, there's a piece from the early, from the 1910s where we start to label ourselves St. Cloud, the nitty gritty granite city, which is a very clever thing to call yourself. Uh, and people remember it. It turns out it was a name they had drawn that, that's, that the Chamber of Commerce had drawn from an advertisement about St. Cloud that was done in Chicago. So that became part of our appeal. But what came along with it was very interesting, right? Because all of a sudden you needed other things to help with the granite. You needed tools to cut. You needed to, to, to polish, to sculpt, to engrave. All of that was needed here. So you started to see people doing precision tool making. Precision tool making is still an industry in St. Cloud, an important industry in St. Cloud. And it got here because people looked at the granite and said, how can we add more value to what we're producing? And the way we did that was to find more tools to be used. But those tools then started to be used for other things, for other industries, right? You can't spend too much time studying the economy of St. Cloud without knowing about Pan Motor Company, right? I actually drive by the Electrolux plant that just was closed back in 2019. That was the what that was part part of that building was the original Pan Motor. That was that was there in 1919. Why did Sam Pandolfo come to St. Cloud? Why would he choose this place? is because we already had the people that knew how to work with precision instruments. How did they get that talent? They got that talent by forming tools that cut granite. My view is also that another industry that's here, and it's part of what my, my, current, my, my current evening reading is about, is how the granite, how granite polishing and granite sculpting and the tools that you use for that led to the fact that these things that I'm wearing right now, which I'm pretty dysfunctional without these eyeglasses, right? There was at one time over 40 eyeglass making companies in this area after World War II. How on earth did they get here? What caused that? Well, yes, it's something about investment and money and so forth, but it's largely about people. And people had those skills. And where did they get those skills? They got those skills by making the tools that cut the granite that went on the ships that used to bring fur down the river all the way back to 1820. I think that's a good place to stop. And I'm anxious to hear your questions. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, the first question that we're going to start the conversation off with today is, how have value systems changed over time and how does that influence whether buildings are preserved, torn down, remodeled, et cetera? Amy, do you want us to start one at a time? How, how would you like us to do this? If you just wanna go one at a time and jump in when you have something to add. OK, um, so I'll start a little bit and I'm not just going to talk about buildings um, because I'm talking about the wider history as well. And um, specifically, I want to talk about within a museum, what do we decide to collect? 
Um, you know, a lot of people make an assumption that a museum is full of old stuff and old has got to be at least 100 years or more old before it comes to a museum. Um, but those of us who work in the museum field actually look at contemporary collecting, which is collecting um, stuff from 1950 forward um, and, um, and, and now collecting as history is happening. I mean, we're watching this pandemic, you know, all living through it. And so we at the Historical Society are already collecting pandemic related material. Um, and, and so, this is part of what we do as well. It is not just museums as old stuff um, and, uh, and and not waiting for time to pass before we collect because it's actually fresher now and we, we probably have um, a better sense of how we currently are interpreting things that we can inject into what we collect. Um, the other thing is um, we, at least at, at the Morrison County Historical Society, I, I think the assumption too is that often museums concentrate an awful lot on people who are wealthy, very important people, and, and not so much on everyday people. But our historical society, founded in 1936, was actually an outgrowth of the WPA, um, Works Progress Administration of the Depression. And um, there was a project at that time to collect over a thousand histories, oral histories from people who lived in the community. And uh, and from that outgrowth, we have always sort of looked at what is everyday people's life like here and, and how can we bring forward those stories um, and not just the stories of the dominant culture, but um, all of these other smaller cultures within or, or the lesser known cultures within the bigger culture. Um, so that's kind of where we come from uh, as, in terms of our history and, and how things have changed. At the Pollution Control Agency, we struggle with this question because uh, value systems can be so subjective and they can change so quickly. And if you were to go to a retail store today, it probably looks different than maybe 10 years ago. Um, we had a few of us had a chance to tour some of the um, uh, Habitat for Humanity restores, and we were asking what's value, what's valuable, what is valued, and what is not. Silver is hot, chrome is not, you know, gold chrome stuff. And who knows if that's going to change again, but it's, it doesn't make sense for people to keep those materials around if they never get reused. Um, but in terms of building, there are still some classic standards of, you know, built well. That, that doesn't seem to go out of fashion too much. However, what is built well may still have facades that look different. And even when we are coming up with one of our recommendations of incentivizing building material buildings that exist or like historical value or structural value, and we're like, you know what? Let's incentivize any building that is reusable and reused and kept intact because it's not our place to say what the value system is. If it has leaky windows, the windows need to be fixed. That actually could be a very, very small fix and keep that building lasting longer, much longer than, well, that's really drafting. Let's tear it down and build new. So we're trying to recognize that the value systems can differ from pe person to person or organization to organization. And let's support any sort of value system that focuses on keeping that building whole or you know upright versus tearing it up. Or having a try to tear it down. I don't know if you guys are all having the sirens go through. Yeah. <clears throat> all I would add uh, to this, and I, I love that um, that connection of value systems and change. Um, I can speak to one quick example. Uh, the Nature Conservancy remodeled an office, uh, actually a very old home, uh, a Sears Roebuck kit home in Morrison County, one of the few remaining kit homes, uh, brick exterior. Um, but in the course of remodeling, we had to bring in plumbing, you know, something as, as radical as that, and infrastructure for IT and and bringing in uh, thermal pane windows for energy. So, so it was a merging of values, not just uh, the, the historic preservation element, uh, which we as an organization valued and wanted to work with the community, the historical society, the homeowners, the landowners, um, but also, you know, this, this energy value and functionality. And the end result was kind of getting the best of both worlds to Melissa's point where you can kind of merge uh, that historic uh, look and feel and the 
the bones, the structurally solid bones of a, of a facility with kind of the new modern needs and energy efficiency where we've added those values to what was historically um, developed. So it's just a fun story to tell. I, I don't have much to add to what you've heard on this, so I won't take much time, but I, I'm I'm trying to draw a contrast between what I observe here in the United States and when I did do that work uh, overseas in these other countries, what I observed is buildings went up, fair, new buildings went up and people sort of flocked to them immediately. And it was, um, the new buildings were, the reason the old buildings were preserved there is because in some sense they were built better. They were just built better. I think what happens in the United States is because we are a country of greater wealth than many of the places where I used to, where I work back in the 90s, um, I think what, you, what, what I observe now is places that are, that are with greater wealth eventually come around to the idea that they should preserve their history. The question is whether you view that as a luxury or a necessity. And what I've been trying to get people to understand is that in some sense, it's unnecessary. I love, love how Mary started this by talking about talking about the museum and your history as your infrastructure. It fits so well with what I'm trying what I'm trying to say, which is which is that you you evolve as an economy, you evolve as a society with layers upon layers and it's not just it's you don't just jump to something that's entirely new and different um and i think that's true of our history and that's why every building that comes down when you lose a little bit of that you're not just losing a building but you're losing a piece of that story a piece of that specialization of what made you special to begin with i think that's a good place Thanks, everyone. The next question is, how does history impact economics and how, how important is history to the economy? Do I get to go first? I was going to say, <laughs> King, you should go first, really. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I, I, I hope I hope in some sense I've helped I've, I've helped give you an answer to that question. Um, but. I think the history of this area, I mean, if you, the history of this region gives you part of that, part of the answer to that. It's history, it's geography. The geography plays a role in thinking about the, about the river and the rocks, right? Uh, but it's also the history of the trail and the fact that we, we wanted to have a road. We, we needed a road here and frankly, we didn't really have anything that resembled the road when the rain came. The, rain, the the roads were terrible. It was only when Fort Ripley got built that that they needed a road that could move heavier equipment. So the road road improvements became to the point where after the army had built the road improvements, all of a sudden all the trade came in right behind it uh, because that was that was was valuable. So if you want to talk about history leading to act to an economy, that would be an example of what that looks like. But I think. Um, I think that works in the other direction as well, because without the economy, without the fact that people really wanted the fur trade in the 1820s, what would have happened here? What would have been here instead? It probably would have been quite different in terms of its development than the fact that it turned out that everybody wanted to wear fur in the early 19th century. Now, I love animals and I don't like people. I don't like the wearing of fur and I don't, I don't hunt. Uh, but I know that the history of this place would be very different. And since I love this place, I guess I have to thank the fur trade a little bit for that. Don't I? King, I, I missed a little bit of what you said um, because of internet connect connectivity issues, but um, this idea of the fur trade, um, and building on history that has occurred before. So with the fur trade, um, the English and French fur traders who came to this area worked heavily and depended on the Native Americans uh, in this area to, to um, gather those furs because they understood what their natural resources were. 
um, and, and how to use them. Also, this idea of where roads are and, and that kind of thing, you know, so often roads follow rivers. The rivers were the highways. Uh, and, and, you know, if we look back, there's a, a map, um, the Andreas Atlas map of the 18, 1872, I want to say, or 1874. I'm familiar um, with One of the things, yeah, one of the things that this map shows in the Morrison County area is an Indian trail coming from the Malak Band to the um, Rice and Skunk Lake area because the natives were um, uh, harvesting the wild rice from those lakes. Uh, so looking back to, you know, previous people's activity here is part of what leads to more economic development from later people. I was thinking about uh, just to build on, on King's statements a little, or thoughts a little bit. Um, the siting of military installations is, is an interesting piece of uh, economic energy in terms of their historic and where they were cited and, and there's even a you know a prehistory of how they were cited in terms of dealing and negotiating treaties and land acquisitions and things like that but once they were cited I'm thinking about Fort Snelling and then later of course Camp Ripley or Fort Ripley originally um, they create their own economic kind of engine or a hub and to your point building roads to them is one of those pieces uh, in addition kind of the supply chain needs, you know, that a fort, a, a military installation is kind of like a city, a microcosm. And then that kind of builds, you know, so that that historic decision, where do we locate this on the heels of probably Zebulon Pike's first notes, you know, which may have given a clue where to locate some of these these facilities, you know, ultimately led to to an economic um, hub of sorts and, and a trade center of sorts and, you know, kind of created a little history around uh, that one installation decision that created an economic link that's, you know, one could argue still evident today. To that point, um, uh, we had um, early on, so 1848, Fort Ripley is, is um, constructed. Um, but uh, right around that same time, Frederick and Elizabeth Eyre started a mission, a co congregational mission very close to Fort Ripley. And they they had a farm there and they supplied Fort Ripley. So that's exactly, definitely part of what they were doing. And a, a lot of those sort of early European American settlers that were here were literally here to help supply the fort. Mm -hmm. You know, that was that was part of what they were doing. Sure, sure. I'll add just a little to this topic, but uh, my take is a little different, though. I, I certainly don't disagree with anything that's been said so far. Um, I'm not a huge fan of terms like millennials and you know Gen Xers and stuff like that because they're they're gross stereotypes in a lot of cases. But when it comes to sustainability related efforts, I, I, I do perk up. And before the pandemic, I remember hearing that people were for holiday shopping, shopping at secondhand stores for uh, because they wanted to, not because they couldn't afford uh, new items. They didn't want new items. And same with, uh, you know, with Rethos and their emphasis on um, preserving, keeping uh, old houses and, and making them your own, making them personal. And so when I hear things like, well, millennials want more choices for multiple forms of transportation, sustainable transportation. They don't necessarily want to own, you know, a cookie cutter home they they want to personalize it and make it their own and um you know just just that there is this generational change that's happening that's actually rejecting the more disposable society from the previous generations and again these are gross stereotypes which i normally hate um but i like to see how the there are there is a movement and i don't think it's certainly changed because of covid there is a move, movement of more sustainable material management in general and i think that may also go to to buildings and and the historical <laughs> value of buildings Well, so you, I'm, gonna, I'm just oh, I was going to say, Amy, I was going to add one more thing here um, in terms of, of the economy and, and how history is important to the economy. So in 2017, our historical society knew we needed some data. So King should like this. Um, we wanted to know uh, what the economic impact of our arts and cultural heritage, including history, we, we history organizations drove this bus here. Um, we wanted to see what our economic impact was in Morrison County. And we had uh, Creative Minnesota, 
uh, do the survey for us. And one of the things they found was that, wow, Morrison County has a lot of history organizations compared to other counties our size and we're like yeah we know that's why we want this data um, and they found an impact within a year of about five million dollars just from our sector uh, so like camp ripley um you know we we do have a huge direct impact uh on the economy uh in this area very cool the question that we have now kind of ties into what melissa was talking about earlier earlier um, on sustainability. The question is, how does using history lead to greater sustainability both in community de development and in other fields? Got to collect my thoughts for a moment there. Um, in terms of using history, um, the fact that we have um, our communities here turning to the historical society for the data they need to preserve buildings is a direct um, sort of one on one from history to sustainability. Like we're trying to keep these buildings up. Um, the other thing in terms of um, sustainability and it's kind of sustainability both of history and the built environment is that so many of our resources help to um, to create studies like um, National Register nominations that give people more information to work with. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think sustainability is kind of built into just what we do. Uh, it's just a little harder to express it because it's sometimes feels very fuzzy and abstract and we have to make it more concrete. Um, also, in terms of a museum, I, I, I'm going to speak for most small museums now. Most of us do not have enough money to operate to the extent that we really want to. I could just at our Morrison County Historical Society probably keep about 10 people fully employed, busy all the time because we have so many collections to manage and programs to that we want to be able to um, provide. Um, and and so we could be a great job creator. We just need more funding to do it. So yeah. I'm going to put that out there. Well, I think that the more people feel connected to a space, to land, to a building, that that connection will prompt, you know, people to to appreciate things more. And, and, and even modern times, if you look at, um, is it thirty eighth and Lake? You know, there's now a historical perspective of our current um, unsettlement and and crises on racial justice, where there's now probably going to be a preservation of the George Floyd's uh, place of murder. And value systems do change, but the his knowing the history of a, a place or a building or whatever makes that thing valuable. So we bought our house in 2017, and the house turns 50 this year, and it's got good bones, but otherwise it's just a 1971 home that you'd see pretty much anywhere USA. But when we shortly after we moved in, we had the contractor come in and give us a quote for something. Don't even remember what. And he's like, oh, I know the guy who made the swirls on uh, the wall. It, it's like stucco material. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember when he did that and I remember when he did that for other homes. And by the way, the house across the street is a farmhouse from the 1800s. I'm in St. Paul. It's kind of weird to have farmhouses across the street, uh, but I'm in Southeast St. Paul and just having people share the history of the land, of the buildings, of the houses, of the nearby this, that, and the other. That's what makes me value where I live so much more. And um, whether it's significant, you know, crises that happen like George Floyd's murder or, you know, people growing farm, you know, farm food off the, the land, they have their own significant connection because of the history. And as long as people are sharing the histories, we hopefully won't forget the histories. So. I'm going to give you a crazy example. 
Um, this one's absurd. It's this not the monkey story. story. My, the, 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 the panel is no my monkey story, and I'm not going to tell it. I promise. Okay, but it does involve bananas. Um, so suppose I suppose I'm looking at a suppose I move into Morrison County, and I see a plant plot of land, and I announce I'm going to spend a bunch of money to buy that piece of land, and on that piece of land I'm going to grow bananas. Okay, um, if I spend enough money, I can buy the land. Right, history as as well as sustainability would tell you. It's probably not a great use of the property. Bananas are not likely to thrive in Morrison County, right? But if you have enough, if you have enough resources, I suppose you could do that. But isn't that a bit of a waste of land? Oh, Anne Marie wants me to tell the monkey story. Well, maybe. Um, I, I'll, I'll wait. Maybe I'll wait till after I finish this answer. Um, so. I think the value of history is to tell those around us, to tell those who come come along after the first peoples were here, here's what this place is good for. Here are the resources. Here are, you know, I, I, I love all this discussion about houses and bones and buildings, okay? I, I don't even know the working end of a hammer. What do I know about this? But, um, but I would, um, I would say that um, in terms of figuring out what a, what community development looks like, sort of the story I'm trying to tell you is knowing the history of the place gives you a pretty good idea of what will work and what won't work. And and honestly, I would hope that uh, a nearby farmer comes over to my fict my fictitious banana farmer and says, "Hey, I actually have a better idea for you than this. Uh, why don't you consider growing uh, growing what used to grow here uh, instead?" uh wheat or corn or, or what have you um that would be a better use of the land than, than that and that's really is a sustainability story because what what growing bananas on a piece of land in morrison county isn't is in a very basic sense it's very wasteful you wouldn't want you wouldn't want someone to do that um and that's the value of history to tell them that doesn't work Todd, did you have anything to add to the question? Well, yeah, I, I enjoyed that story as well. <laughs> the the pushing it open is certainly I come from I'm a conservation professional, and so when 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 development in general pushes back against what the the native plant communities were, uh, the the native natural resource systems were, it just seems like it's twice as much work to make something else other than to allow you know what had evolved and and developed here over many many thousands of years of, of uh, uh, ecological evolution. So yeah, that that it kind of works as metaphor too to to think about you know how we push against how hard we push against. Um, you know what what could be more sustainable long term so the lessons learned is is the piece that i i wanted to key in quickly and that is um in conservation work and around the camp Ripley Center in the landscape if we have developed a methodology that works to help um, deliver conservation and we find a new tool a new issue to kind of focus on um we can use the the history from tools that worked. And so uh, King's example of the rock quarry to the precision tools to the lenses, I love that story because it's it's it it just shows, you know, building on what you know and and then just taking it to another level. Some innovative entrepreneurial mind will just see a new use for that tool and it opens up a whole new door. And the same happens for conservation work. We see how to do a piece of the work over here, and then we can build on that history to to create something a little better without having to reinvent the wheel to use a overused cliche. So tying in to kind of how Melissa talked about learning the history behind her house and Kane talking about the history of the land and, you know, not wanting to grow bananas in Morrison County, which, you know, there might be a market for it, but probably not the best. Um, how do we teach people a strategy for using history intentionally for community development? 
Um, I'm going to start here because we see everybody that walks in here who needs to use our research materials. And I would urge people to start with the history. Like literally, you're going to buy this piece of property or you're going to buy this building or you want to do like you want to write a book. Come start looking around at your local historical society and and you know, you ask a question to the staff here who've been, you know, any of the county historical societies. There are 87 uh, and there are over 500 history museums in Minnesota. Um, you walk in and you are going to find this huge, huge, huge wealth of knowledge and people will start pointing you in directions you probably never even thought to go. Um, literally right before our session today, I started looking at the history of Vernon Pick who found he he had a mill site here in Morrison County near Royalton. It burned down. He moved west, found a huge uranium mine and made $9 million off of it. and. Interestingly enough, I go to talk to our museum assistant, Grace, and, and I said, oh, I'm thinking about writing about Vernon Pick for our newsletter. And she said, Vernon Pick? Uranium mines. And she knows about Vernon Pick from a song that shows up in a video game called Fallout. And I'm like, look at how this has all just cycled around. And if you come to the history first and start there, you just have this sort of mind-blowing experience of opening up uh, just all kinds of creativity, just to look at your past and then move forward from there. Maybe as a state agency, we're not as overt as we should be, but having people share their history may help us further our sustainable building material management goals. That's all I got. I think um, I wanted to build on what Melissa had said earlier too about how important, you know, people knowing their history, uh, it might inspire them. I think that image you showed of the house, you know, the old house needs paint, needs some work, DIY. Uh, but if you can explain, you know, where that came from and, and the story behind it might well inspire the right person. And I think that example plays out time and time again um, in communities. It affects community development. Um, how many times do you, do you hear about cities building around historic uh, events, occurrences, even buildings? You know where that truly is you know a big part of their identity and 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 for good cause it's place making it's, it's a way for people to really understand where they came from uh to some extent and then be a part of it going forward i'm in this old historic house i'm in you know i'm even proud to tell talk about our office remodel because we're part of the morrison county history story you know in, in some small way um, so it makes you feel like you're a part of history isn't an abstract thing anymore. It's something that you're still living in and with today. And, and you can kind of see that it's part of a, a long trend, a long line, you know, then you're just a, this part of that, that, that adventure. I'm not sure I have a lot to add to what you've heard, uh, but uh, I, I do think, I do think about the fact that, uh, you go back to you know where I started with fur trade, and we just wanted to consume furs. And even after World War II, we just wanted to consume things, and we didn't spend as much time, I think, thinking about the places in which we were consuming them. I think as this society has developed, uh, as societies generally develop, um, we tend to turn away from consuming things to consuming experiences and consuming consuming uh, consuming. Uh, you know, all of how you are receiving something, not just that process. So we go from we go from wanting to have TV dinners because we just wanted to have a plate of food because we were busy working to the fact that we now want to consume, you know, uh, farm to table products, you know, in our in our community. So that's the sustainability part. People want that. And I think that's part of I think that's part of the history by perhaps telling them telling them uh, I can imagine someone creating a farm to table experience by by telling the story of here's how the food would have been received if you had been consuming this very meal 150 years ago. I think there's a market for that. I, I actually I would if there was a restaurant that did that, I'd want to go. Uh, 
And I think I think there might be others that would as well. But I tell you what, it'd be a lot different than the kind of foods you get in a restaurant today. Yeah, that reminds me of Sous Chef, where it's a Native American organization that provide that uh, caters food, um, Native American traditional foods, wonderful foods too. Something you said sparked something in me, and I keep forgetting. I keep remembering. Keep forgetting. Um, the the necessity necess, necessity or luxury of preserving buildings, and you know we look to Europe and they have buildings that were built thousands of years ago in structures and they're still valued and appreciated even if they're not in the same form they were thousands of years ago. We can't get things to last 20 to 70 years. Um, I would imagine that it took a lot of effort to build those buildings to the point where the necessity and luxury wasn't even a question. It's just what you did because it took so much effort to build in the first place and you can't just tear down and rebuild when you're relying on human power and then yeah, that yeah. just well, kind of woke up my mind on you know maybe why we don't value things and my mind went to so many other places that i have so many questions for you now <laughs> you know what woke up a lot of people i at least i, I it woke me up even more was uh watching the fire at notre dame in paris I mean, it, it, I mean, the fact that we all, I don't know about you, I actually, it was almost like I was watching the, the Iraq war back in 1990 when we first all became fascinated with CNN. Um, it was for me the same sort of thing. I'm on my computer watching live video that I think was coming off a cell phone of a piece of another country that I felt, I felt part of their culture was burning down before my eyes. And it was an incredibly sad experience. Uh, and uh, and I, I I dare I dare anyone to watch that and not feel some sense of loss from it. Uh, and 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 I think we've even had that happen here with with a paper mill up in up in Sartell. Uh, when it caught fire, there were people people who felt like a part a part of part of this area had burnt to the ground. Uh, and and um, I think I, I so yeah I think maybe that's the way you sort of drive down that history as part of your community's development. Kind of on that note, with everything, then how has its history impacted each of your work? For each of you. Um, for me, it's probably pretty obvious that the Morrison County Historical Society, our whole purpose is our county history. Um, so it's just a very short, sweet answer, but my goodness, it just leads to all kinds of other things for us. I think it's interesting for me with the Nature Conservancy and looking at the history of our organization well over 60 years now, um, started out with a methodology of uh, preserving unique, um, diverse places to protect plants and animals. And, and uh, quickly, science and understanding of systems ecology kind of entered into that dis decision making. So it wasn't just a little place, a postage stamp of property. It was where this fit in the context of an ecological system. And then, oh, it, you know, one group alone can't do this. We need to work with multiple organizations and communities and people are a part of the formula and not not set aside from nature. And so there have been evolutions of history in how we do conservation work um, that informs us to be better at it, more engaged and, and more meaningful to, to all of us, we hope, um, from what uh, it started as, you know, some 60 years ago. So you're learning, you know, from your past history and the history of others um, to how to, you know, be better as we go forward. And I think that affects building, building codes. Um, you know, I, uh, there's too many stories to tell, but I'll just stop there. <laughs> So I've been the same way my entire career, and as a public servant, I've been challenged time and time again to not think about my goals, but to think about it from the user's perspective, customer's perspective, the regulated party's perspective. And 
that that lent a, a nice lens for when I walked into this program a year and a half ago. And we are not at the state of Minnesota at the Pollution Control Agency, the experts in sustainable building material management. Those that are preserving buildings, those that have that history uh, connectivity as well as um, are the ones that are you know, preserving or deconstructing buildings. And so that history perspective, like I mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily a value system that I'm trying to, uh, you know, give to others or put upon others. They're influencing me on what they value and it's their history that matters. And so um, it's been you know, refreshing to have other people tell me what of their history matters and shaping decisions that can try to recognize uh, different value systems, different histories being just as important as another. Um, it's difficult, it's uncomfortable, but I'm really glad that I came in with this mentality of, I don't know what the right answer is. You tell me, you're the ones that have been doing whatever you're doing for so long that it's your value system that I'm embracing. So I work, I've worked at St. Cloud State for over 35 years now. In fact, they're supposed to be giving me some pin or something to tell me that. I, I guess I already know. Uh, and only in the last several years since I've become uh, dean have I been reflecting on this fact that St. Cloud State is, you know, has a commission as a steward of place. And what does stewardship really mean? Um, what does that what does that mean to us? Well, part of it is this is where we're going to be. We're 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 what uh, people in uh, my profession in higher education call an anchor institution. We can't pick up and move anywhere, like the steamship. Even we can't do that. We're we're always going to be in St. Cloud, and so its history is is embedded in us. Uh, it is part it is part of what we are. And if that history is to have I don't want to say a happy ending because I don't believe it's ending, but if it wants to have a happy continuation from here, it's on us to do that. And so what we try to do uh, with my colleagues and I here uh, is to create a cadre of peop of uh, students. I'm, I'm working a relatively small school. We have about 800 students within the larger uh, 12,000 students here at St. Cloud State, but our school is trying to create students with a public affairs perspective who take that stewardship of place seriously. Not every one of my students is gonna stay in the St. Cloud area. I wish they would. I wish we didn't export quite so many of them to other places, but we will. Uh, but for those who do remain here, we hope that part of what we're leaving them is a sense of the history of this place and why I, I spend so much time talking about the fact that you are built, you are standing on the shoulders of those who came before you to the to the first nations of this of this area uh and and that is that is part of what your stewardship is is to honor respect that and see what you can put upon it that continues the story we did get a question come in in the chat um, how can we help schools teach local history, buildings, and all the things? Does it belong in an economics course as well as the social studies? Um, the Morrison County Historical Society back in 2001, 2002 actually wrote a local history cu curriculum um, for our local school district and it is available online um, and I know the schools are still using it. So some of that work has been done. Um, however, uh, one of the difficulties you find when you work in history is that there's always far more history than you will ever grasp. And how do you teach it all? You know, so much of it is really important to know. And so I think learning the process of how to do history and helping people to think, hey, I should check this out historically. Um, getting people to do those kinds of things um, are more important than the sort of the individual things that you might learn in history because they do eventually all weave together. And there are things I learned my you know 20 some years ago here at the Historical Society that I have changed my mind and my thinking on as I get more information. Uh, so it's an ongoing process. 
uh, in terms of, um, of in terms of learning. And so I, I don't know how you pack that into little kids um, other than giving them the methods to actually practice history. So another question along those lines is how do we help schools teach difficult history? Um, you know, it's interesting to think about what might be considered difficult history. Um, you know, we when we tackle history and different topics, you know, we, we start with what is the story we're trying to tell and, you know, um, providing a perspective basically from an individual um, and then working out from there. And I think that there tend to be more commonalities among people than there are differences and it's helping people to learn those commonalities. Um, and also not to necessarily shy away from the difficult history. You, you have to sort of tackle it, but in a sensitive way. Um, and, and that's probably, you know, um, its own topic and its own kind of a, a session uh, as far as a, um, some kind of a webinar in itself, just, just to cover that particular aspect. Um, King, how do you handle that? I, it, so I wanted to answer the previous question and I'll, and, and, and I'll take your question along with it. Um, Ed Lemer, who is an economist at uh, UCLA, um, wrote a book several years ago in which he described humans as pattern seeking storytellers. Right. And so maybe that's so if I think about that and I think about how to teach it to go back to Michelle's question uh, in the chat. Um, if you want to teach local history, the thing to teach is the patterns. And and what I what I've been trying to talk about is 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 there's a pattern in development. And I, I've taken a view of the development of other countries and trying to bring it down into thinking about our own and thinking about just this region within our own place. It goes into it goes into finding those patterns, but you, to find the patterns and to tell the full story, you need to confront some pretty some pretty important patterns that are not pleasant to talk about if you talk about difficult subjects, right? We tend to not we we started as people who were in who were in tribes, kin networks, and so forth. And part of being within those networks has always been going back millennia has been thinking of others outside of that as being dangerous to you. So that's just part of that teaching process and to see how that resistance to the other has told the history of this region, the history of those who were here before European settlers, I think is part of the story that you have to tell. Because it's not only that you learn the history, but then we learn how to deal with additional ways of people who have come to us going forward. It helps us deal with with questions of xenophobia and racism and, 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 and sexism and so forth. Those things are part of telling that historical story. Um, and I think in that doing, I think you can say, and I love teaching, I love teaching comparative systems because the stories I tell about, about you know, river traffic and trading and tra small things, and then finally finding something that's larger to trade and then adding value to the large thing and, and getting bigger are stories we tell about the development of, of countries around the world. So it's not only that you can tell the story of central Minnesota with that, but you can then also explore, expose your classrooms to all kinds of other places and let people see how their place is part of a much wider world. Mary, I'm going to over you to close this out so we can end here on time. Thanks, Amy. Um, okay, so I want to uh, thank everybody who attended today. Uh, this has been fun, and as you can tell from our panelists, we could probably keep going. Um, so I want to thank our panelists, uh, King and Melissa and Todd. 
And then our moderator, Amy Pekarski from Sourcewell. I also want to thank Amory Johnson, who really got everything together, and she's the one who was so busy helping register everyone. Uh, Grace, our museum assistant. Uh, Phoebe Ward, who's a fellow with the City of Little Falls, has also helped out. And I also want to thank uh, Ashley Zayden, who is formerly of Sourcewell. She just uh, switched to a new job, and so, but she helped us with some of the formative work on this uh, particular series. Um, now, uh, we're all done with our brick series, but we are sending you an email um, and hoping that you will help us with an evaluation of the series so we can um, make plans as to whether we want to do another one. Uh, and uh, so you should be able to look for that in your email. Uh, and uh, we will also be sending you contact information for everybody who was part of our panel today. Uh, so thank you so much. And we are ending absolutely right on time. Hallelujah.